Welcome everyone. I did a research paper on fandoms and parasocial relationships in the digital age. So first, what is parasocial relationship? Well, uh, researchers Donald Horton and Richard Hull developed this theory that explained the relationships formed between the audience and the media. When I mean the media, I am going to be referring to is uh, anyone who works in entertainment and media, be it the talent on screen and technicians and people behind the screens. So, I think it needs to be updated. Why? Because in 1956 is when they, they developed this theory. They defined it as when a person forms a one-sided relationship with the media they consume. Consumption is when they watched a television program or went to the movie theater and then uh, scheduled times. Then, the only way you could really contact the media, someone in the media, was when you um, wrote a letter or called the studio, or sometimes like waited in line to meet them. And Horton and Wool said that if you do that, then it's no longer parasocial. You're making your uh, admiration known to the media. But in 2017, we have a lot more access to media. So my update to the definition is, when a person forms a one-sided relationship with the media, however, consumption has grown. So that means you can watch television programs, films, read, listen to music on your computer, on your smartphone, on your tablet, in a big screen, on a television, anytime, anywhere. On top of that, how do you contact them? Well, you can contact them through social media. It's not just writing a letter or calling the studio. So you and communicating to them that you're a fan of them. So communicating also includes that you follow your favorite movie star, you, you like their posts, you tweet, that's awesome, or you have a question for them. And it's still parasocial because that doesn't mean that they understand like you as an individual and that it's gonna be a two way. If they do respond to you, then it's outside of parasocial. So how did I come up with this and what did I do my methods with? Well, I've read literature that started from the 50s up to the present about parasocial relationships, um, did a little research on entertainment before and after uh, technology really took over. So as you can see, like this is rough estimates of when entertainment, forms of entertainment could give, be given to a person um, directly to them. Uh, printing press allowed your written, your favorite stories and things in the comfort of your own home. By 1922, the radio was in a lot of people's homes. That meant that they could listen to the news, music, um, drama, theater in their home. Then television came, and that's when, by 1956, Horton Wool said that this seemingly face-to-face -face interaction started a parasocial relationship, para meaning one-sided. You're seeing them, but they're not seeing you. But it makes the illusion that you are. Um, then by the 90s, internet came uh, into a lot of people's homes, which gave you more access to media and entertainment. And then by 2007, smartphones became really popular, and then it was literally in the palm of your hand. Um, so first, what did that matter? So, so like... After really digital media took over, around the 2000s specifically, uh, not only could people reach out to their fandoms, but the fandoms can reach out to the public directly. So these are examples of Justin Bieber on the left side was, is the number two most followed person on Twitter. Uh, before, musicians and performers and studios would use a third party to reach out to the fan saying, you want to know when such and when we're going to be performing, you want to know when the premiere of our next episode is, you would have to go to a newspaper, talk show host, listen to the radio until it came on. Now they go directly to the fans. So that's Justin Bieber letting his over 93 million followers know his tour dates. Game of Thrones for their Facebook, used Facebook Live to release the date of their season seven premiere. And now it's the cover photo. So that meant if you wanted to know when the next season is, you didn't have to check through HBO or through Entertainment Weekly. You can go directly to the HBO Game of Thrones Facebook page and know 
right then and there. It's July 16th. Um, so how does that kind of affect the relationships? Well, now they have a direct access to the fans, and the fans have a direct access to them. Um, it's an open letter was written to One Direction fans by a Backstreet Boy fan. Um, and he, that's right, he wrote, in an open letter, uh, he said, you don't know the struggle. And until you've, you've been schooled on the reality of our lives as BSB fans, you'll never know how good you have it now. BSB rarely shared their innermost feelings with us because they didn't have a Twitter account that we could follow. You have more of a chance of reaching Harry Styles than I ever did of complimenting Howie Doro on his Roswell cameo. So that is how it began. Like now this, there's this kind of tenuous relationship being formed. But is it two-sided? Not really. But first, before we get into that, I wanted to talk about the effects of parasocial on people. Here are two pretty popular memes you probably saw around. Um, one deals with emotional identification and the other emotional attachment. There's two types of people in this world, those who like Tyrion and those who don't watch Game of Thrones. And then the second one is, I can't come to work today because of a work of fiction has left me emotionally crippled. Um, researcher uh, and sociologist Chris Wojcik explains, emotional identification with media figures is the heart of parasocial relationships. And several researchers have found out face-to-face -face interactions and parasocial interactions have very similar beginnings and ends. So first, there's a fam uh, you meet them and you spend time with them, and a familiarity grows, and then a relationship blossoms out of it. So for instance, you start graduate school, and you're thrown into a group project, and you start spending time with this person. Then meanwhile, you start watching a new television show and you're kind of watching it regularly like at dinner time you start having this like oh I really like this person oh my gosh I really like Tyrion he's such a fun character and then you decide I want to spend time with this person outside of this group project and then you also feel an attachment to Tyrion to the show as well so it's very similar they found there are four dimensions of identification that are involved in parasocial relationships. First is an empathy for the character. And you feel happy or sad with the character, not just for the character. That's an important distinction. So if, let's say, the main character finally gets the girl of his dreams, you also feel like you got her too, not just for him. Uh, the second is a cognitive aspect with the character meaning uh, you believe you understand where the character's coming, for, coming from and their, their uh, characters and motivations. The third dimension addresses the degree to which the audience member internalizes them. So when they, it's, there's a quote in one of the studies saying, when I see her, I don't see a TV character, I see myself. Fourth dimension is absorption. You believe you are the character. That gets a little tricky. Um, and, and people who've had this uh, fourth dimension have been shown to have mental uh, disorders. But for the purposes of my paper, I concentrated on the first three. Now, I interviewed seven people. And they all follow their watch television shows, follow them online, and have communicated in some form. Obviously, the first form is, I'm going to follow you online. I like you. Um, the one exception I want to point out is Martha watches Space 1999. It premiered in 1975, 75, and what happened was um, it has a continuous following, and she has heavily been involved since 1975. So they have regular conventions. They uh, met with the actors and the creators, and she explained very little of them because they are literally dying off have an online presence, but those who do, she does tend to follow. Um, everyone else follows uh, all the main cast members and other fan social media, be it a Twitter parody or um, a fan Instagram account, Tumblr, things like that. Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram were the biggest forms of social media people would follow. 
And then um, most of them would follow the official television show's social media. And then 60% of them would get into kind of the writers, the executive producers, the directors, things like that. But all of them followed the main cast and other fandoms. Um, when it came to identification, I had learned that a lot of them, their favorite characters had some shared characteristic and something that they wish they had. For instance, um, one of my interviewees, Elia, is one of the youngest people, and her fandom was Game of Thrones and A Song of Ice and Fire, which is based, the show is based off of A Song of Ice and Fire. And she said, I'm close in age with Sansa, and Sansa went through so much heartbreak and loss and violence, but she stayed strong, and I wish I was like that. So she had that shared connection. Maggie is a guardian for a teenager. She's been a mentor. She's been a teacher. And so she really uh, liked the storytelling of Supergirl because it portrayed adoption and mentor-mentee relationships correctly, in her opinion. She really liked that. Um, attraction was a huge reason for why people stayed on fandoms. For instance, Carol said, pretty much all my strong female characters are my favorite characters. Guys are awesome too, but I mostly just like looking at them. Fair enough. Uh, Natalie wished she was like Jess from New Girl, optimistic, but she also admitted she wished she had Nick Miller, the, character, the boyfriend on the show, as her boyfriend. Elia had her frustrations with the show. She loves the books and she doesn't really like the show as much, so I asked her, why do you continue watching the show? And she goes, I think the actor Kit Harington's cute. Fair enough. But not only has digital media changed how we interact with media, it has changed how we watch it. Two popular forms of media is of watching media is co-viewing and binge watching. Co-viewing is when you're watching something with another person, and I learned that it does not mean they have to be in the same room. If you're live tweeting, if you're texting your friend, that is considered co-viewing. Binge watching is when you watch episodes after episode in rapid succession. So how does that affect their parasocial relationships? Natalie found that she binge watched all of her shows that she spoke with me about. Game of Thrones, New Girl, Stranger Things. And she said, I was more attached, emotionally attached to New Girl and Game of Thrones because there's only eight episodes of Stranger Things while there's three times as much for the other shows. But as far as co-viewing, Elia would watch um, Game of Thrones and be on Google Hangout with her best friend. And she said, it was more fun watching together, actually. We had more fun reacting to one another. And a researcher uh, found that co-viewing and subsequent discussion of the figure may strongly influence the development of the parasocial relationship. So if you want to get in a little closer, um, Especially on Twitter was a lot of co-viewing, meaning you tweeted to people and there's live tweeting. Going back to the fandoms, going to the fans, they will live tweet. So over 80% have tweeted to the show at some point. 60% of that time, the show tweeted back to them. So yes, that's no longer parasocial, but it's not necessarily a relationship either. I'll get to that first later. Um, then most of them, over half of them, have live tweeted with the show and with other fandoms. So why would people follow in the first place? That was my last question. Why did you follow them? Why did you contact them in the first place? And I said, well, one thing is I wanted to show my appreciation towards them. And another thing is I wanted to see like behind the scenes and have some, see them from a personal perspective. So here's an example of Amelia Clark, who's an actress from Game of Thrones. This is my Instagram account. I see, as you can see, I liked it. Um, but here she is in November 2016. They were filming in Spain for Game of Thrones, and they went to a soccer match. And it was fun to see her with her co-stars Peter Dinklage and Connell Hill. And then behind her, as you can see, is one of the creators of the show, David Benioff. So it was fun to see, like, oh, my gosh, they actually hang out, and they're in Spain. What's going on? So that's it. Um, one of my interviewees, uh, 
was talking about with her experience with uh, especially youth and entertainment, she had a good point. She says people have this perception that they know these actors as people in ways they don't. And that's when it can get uh, become issue. You are seeing a window into who they are, but especially when you think about people who spend a lot of time online and read all this stuff and about how the ability to interpret personal interactions have grown weaker amongst younger people because they don't do it as often, you have bu people building up these one-sided relationships that aren't real. When it came to back to like why did you contact them in the first place uh, there were two instances that were really interesting um, Candace was voluntarily uh, managing a fan website for the Vampire Diaries and the originals so she constantly got in contact with the show and organized events she was tweeting with them regularly and they would follow her on Twitter and so one time she met the cast of the originals so she describes when uh, I went to Daniel Gillies and I said, I think you follow me on Twitter. And he knew exactly who I was. And I'm like, that's just bizarre. It was very uncomfortable and I found myself when I was confronted with the actual actors that I didn't know how to behave because I was very aware these are not my friends. I don't know these people personally, but we have this strange relationship that is very tenuous. So on top of parasocial relationships, which is Yes, you can make your feelings known to your fandom, but that doesn't necessarily mean they'll, they'll interact with you, so it can still be one-sided. Once it's two-sided and the interactions we have online, it's not something that we really know. There's no word to describe it yet, really. The closest that from my research was like an acquaintance. So that's something else that I think is good for further study. What are the relationships considered when you're communicating solely online. Deborah had the most unique experience, and it's like a dream come true. But she also found it very interesting and uh, bizarre. She emailed George R. R. Martin, the writer of A Song of Ice and Fire. Uh, she found his email through his live journal, and she thought he'll never respond, but she wants to make a cookbook based off of his world that he created. Two weeks later, she gets a reply saying, my publishers love the idea, I love the idea, we're flying you over to San Diego Comic-Con, we're going to have dinner and we're going to work on the recipes. It's published, you can buy it on Amazon. She was like, wow, never thought that would happen. But because of this ability that digital media had allowed, it started the opening process of forming these kinds of business relationships now. Um, the other ones tended not to really communicate. Elia called herself a lurker. She only likes and she only follows. She's like, what? I don't feel like it makes a difference if I say I really like your character or I love you and all that. They, they get it. You have this many followers, you get it. And um, Carol agreed with that stance, but she also said, I think the only time I ever actively written something was when Stana Kadic, the, the lead actress on Castle, was fired from the show Castle. I was one of those who said, you need to cancel the show. I'm not watching without Stana. And I did this by commenting on Instagram, sometimes Facebook, and also signed a few petitions. These interviews allowed me to see how fans, the perspective of the fans, and how it is for them to communicate with their fandoms. So where does this leave us with parasocial now? Um, I'm going back to one of my older slides. I still think it's a one-sided relationship we're exposed to the media more often so just because you contact them online unless they contact back to you I still think that's one-sided so it's still parasocial and then I also recommend that we need to start working into what are these relationships that we do form online um, Deborah said the sort of miracle of social media is that you do get to connect with people even if it's just for a question I think only it gives you the slightest beginning of any kind of relationship. So feelings and attachments an audience has to the media have grown. Parasocial relationships, I believe, still describe these intimacies, but it needs to be updated to meet the growing change and influence of the digital age. Thank you.